Hey climbers, welcome back to Climb by VSC, a weekly show about building and scaling startups in the world of climate innovation. My name is Jacob Poor, general partner of VSC Ventures and co-host of Climb. Every week, I or a member of our VSC team will speak with a pioneer in the climate tech world about emerging technologies and novel ideas that will turn the tide on climate change. We've all heard enough of the doom and gloom. It's time for stories of purpose-driven innovation that lead to sustainable, positive change. As always, I'm so happy that you've decided to join us. Now let's climb. Hey, climbers, welcome back to another episode of Climb by VSC. I'm excited to have today on the show uh, David Roberts, who is the proprietor, self-described, of the newsletter and podcast called Volts about clean energy and politics. David, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, look, I'm excited to jump in uh, to quite a few things, especially uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which I feel like we've talked about in so many of our past episodes, but talked around it. And I feel like you've been covering mm -hmm. it for so long. Um, there's going to be a, a lot of meat on that bone for us to dig into. But why don't we start with, you know, you've, you've been a writer uh, and, and you've been uh, working with a lot of publications, including The Grist and Vox, but you left that to pursue an, a career as an independent writer and podcaster. So tell me about that journey a little bit. And then what was the inspiration that led you to starting Volts? Well, it's, Looking back now, it all makes complete sense. <laughs> Looking back now, it looks like a coherent trajectory. So I started at a very obscure, tiny little um, uh, environmental website called Grist, where I where I spent ten years basically just teaching myself, learning about all this stuff, and and writing away in relative obscurity, <laughs> and then sort of slowly built an audience, and then moved over to Vox and built more of an audience. And so then, you know, after five years at Vox. Um, you know, like what inspired me is that I found out it was possible, basically. <laughs> like, like I, have, I had a friend who started a Substack, and and I, you know, wrote her a, a million questions, uh, like how how is this possible? How is this real? And uh, you know, sub, the Substack team reached out to me and asked if I wanted to to make the jump. Uh, and so I found out like I can run my own thing, be my own boss, do what I want to do, and the only the beauty to me is the only relationship. I have is directly with readers, like readers and listeners. If they find it valuable, they pay a little bit. Yeah. And if they don't, they don't. And there's no advertisers, there's no sponsors, there's no organizational, you know, I'm, I don't speak for anyone or answer to anyone but myself. It's, it's, uh, it's like, I feel like it's a little bubble in the midst of a very stormy uh, climate for media right now. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's sort of the true definition of independent, you know, writer, because there's yeah. independent writers that write for multiple publications, but you know, there, there's always multiple mouths to feed. You talked about ad supported yes. and, and uh, the different directions. And we've seen quite a few of these um, sub stacks that start with niche topics actually evolve into to quite large followings, right? I, I follow one on product management and I wouldn't have expected, you know, somebody like Lenny Richitsky to have, yeah. I don't know, hundreds well, the, of thousands of subs on a topic like that. The, the secret is, and this is what was very eye-opening to me is, you don't need a ton of, you know, like when you're at Vox, it's constantly traffic, traffic, traffic. Like anything that's ad supported is you need eyeballs, you need the broadest audience possible, you need yeah, to that's right. the, cast the widest net possible. But the thing is, if you have people paying you directly for your work with no intermediaries taking a chunk out of it, you don't need that many to make a living. You know, like once you get to, you know, say uh, 3,000, two to 3,000 paid subscribers, which is a relatively modest amount. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a that's a living, <laughs> you know, yeah. and everything yeah. after that is just gravy. So. So, you know, what looks like niche in the in the perspective of mainstream media is actually like, you know, like if I, could just, <laughs> if I could just get all the people who are excited about clean energy, that's enough to, you know, more than more than uh, uh, pay for my my meals. So, yeah, you know, it, niche it, is uh, it's, the, it's the beauty of the Substack model is it enables niche audiences and niche writers and, and podcasters to find one another. And it turns out they can do perfectly well together without any of the rest of the infrastructure. In your experience, having been writing about this for you know two decades almost, what do you think really drives that, that audience engagement? Like what, what, what are readers looking for when it comes to these complex topics 
about climate innovation and, and technology? Well, my, um, you know, I should, by way, by way of preface, I should say, like, I started at Grist, I knew nothing about any of this. I had no environmental background, I had no knowledge of climate, I had no nothing. I was a babe in the woods. I had half a PhD in philosophy. That's... <laughs> That's what I started with. So so in terms of what I learned, it's entirely self-taught. And then also in terms of what I write about, it's entirely found, you know, nobody told me what to write about, basically. So I, I, I stumbled my way to my own topics. And I found a few, uh, you know, a few kinds of pieces really resonate. And interestingly, it's not always the ones that your sort of publishers and editors at big publications think are going to hit like I've you know I had just had some sort of tension with bosses my whole career because I've always want to go nerdier I always want to go a little deeper you know I always want to go the next level down and there's this constant worry at big publications like you're going to lose people people don't care about people don't care about the tech you know all these acronyms you're going to scare people off and you have to start every story the same way. Like Bob stood on the hill and squinted at the wind turbine in the distance. You know, you have to bring people in with, you know, they care about people. They don't care about these acronyms. And, and I just like, it's just not true. Like every, every time I've bet on going deeper response is, is immediate and overwhelmingly positive. Like people want to know what is really going on, how things really work, how things really fit together. And the other, the other half is, Specifically on climate, you know, the first probably 10 years I wrote about climate, I started in the early 2000s. It was a obscure issue, like in terms of U.S. politics, it was a pretty fringe issue. And all the solutions were so either theoretical or super expensive or so the whole topic was very abstract and generally what the discussion was climate is big and scary and bad and it's coming and be terrified and you know if you want solutions you what like go march in the street or go into politics there wasn't you know there was it, it was just not a inviting <laughs> you know but what's changed over time and this is what I think uh, my listeners respond to is the issue itself, the fight against climate change, the whole thing has sifted down past the sort of activist and political class down into ordinary people at ordinary businesses, you know, and so it's down on the shop floor now and the engineers are at it. And so it's become less of a sort of political matter of symbolism versus counter symbolism. And now it's like a big technical puzzle with a with a hundred thousand pieces that all of us are working together to put together and it's just fascinating like there's so many little bits and pieces of our economy where you think like well we use carbon doing that now how do we not how do we not use carbon doing that and every one of those you know steel concrete driving around getting to school <laughs> school buses i mean name it like every every little piece of that is a puzzle that somebody's got to solve and what my listeners respond to more than anything else is in the face of that climate dread, nothing cheers people up more than just hearing about clever people out there solving some little piece of this problem. There's so many clever people out there right now yeah. doing so many clever things. And this to me is the antidote to climate dread is, you know, it's like, it's like Mr. Rogers said when something goes wrong when there's a disaster when there's it's scary look for the helpers and that's what my podcast has basically become most of now is just i'm looking for the helpers all the people out there doing their clever little things solving their little pieces of the puzzle and just knowing that they're out there is enormously i think <laughs> rewarding to listeners and that's what they respond yeah. to i mean you know uh, the question I, I i was always in you know uh come to this is with like how have the stakeholders changed? And you, you kind of uh, got ahead of me there, which is that there are just so many more stakeholders that we're talking about yeah. industries that for decades have been doing things a certain way that now, whether it's because there's money in it in the IRA or because they're just looking for internal efficiencies in their business that are now starting to pay attention to this stuff. And it leaves a lot of room for you to have those conversations. Yeah, and a corollary uh, of that 
is that because fossil fuels are so cheap for so long and so many of these businesses that we're talking about have been sort of in a rut doing things the same way for, for years and years and years, there's just a lot of low-hanging fruit. Because people, people haven't been looking, like you say, like a lot of businesses and people are just starting to sort of wake up and look around now and think like, how can we reduce, how can we do this more efficiently? How can we do this with less carbon? And because for a lot of these businesses, it's the first time anyone's ever really looked. And because also that technology has come along so fast, like semiconductors and computing power has gotten so small now and can be put into anything that just opportunities are opened up now that weren't opened up before. So there's just, um, you don't have to be a super genius to find some advance. And and yet we're not seeing the larger outlets kind of covering it in that way, uh, even the ones that have sort of dedicated climate desks. Do you do you have a thought on why, you know, it's, it's maybe easier to do it or, or other folks haven't tried it? Because it sort of feels like, hey, if it's working, Somebody's going to come along and, and, you know, do it at larger scale. <laughs> this is the thing about mainstream journalism. It's always a little bit puzzling to me. It's it's they don't trust that their readers want the real deep story. Right. Mm. But but the topic itself is technical and deep enough to to. So only a, a niche of people are going to want to read it in the first place. So you have this like weird um valley of death where it's like too technical for most people, but not technical enough for the people who actually want to read it. And so it ends up being sort of like boring and read by read by no one, you know, and the <laughs> only way you can get wide readership is if you say new battery will revolutionize the world next yeah. week. And y- yeah. you know, you get, you get some short term clicks for those kind of things. But, but I just think um, most big publications will a, they don't trust their readers and listeners enough and yeah. B you know, as I mentioned before, if you are working on the advertising model, you need mm, clicks. Makes perfect sense. So we we can move away from the the business of covering uh, climate media to <laughs> actually talking about some of the stuff that's um, I think going to be interesting for a lot of our readers that are that are in the startup world because you know we're always thinking about where is the opportunity, whether it's for our investors that are listening or for founders that are are working on this that are passionate about actually making an impact with the technologies they're working on, bringing some of that optimism. You've talked about the grid's edge and that being something that you're interested in, stories at the grid's edge Mm -hmm. that are compelling to you as opposed to, you know, supply side technologies. Can you help define what the grid's edge is and and then why those stories are are so compelling for you? Sure. I mean, you know, in in, in broad terms, the the big story is the the electricity grid for most of its lifetime for most of the last century was composed on this model where you have big power plants and then you have big transmission lines that carry the power and then offload the power into distribution grids where it's carried to the locals. And that was all a basically a one-way flow, right? Water, you can think of it in, in hydrological terms, it's just water cascading out of the power plant through the rivers of transmission, down into the streams of distribution, into homes and businesses, which were effectively dumb consumers, just passive, passive consumers of this energy. And so, as everyone in our world knows by now, that is in the midst of radically reshuffling itself in that those homes and businesses out at the edge of the grid, down at the end of the distribution line, now are a generating energy on their own they are all they're becoming power plants they also have storage power storage um, uh, popping up in terms of of home storage or evs and they're just getting much 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 smarter so you have these sort of all these smart devices smart appliances smart whatever this and that that can time usage time charging sort of coordinate the loads at the edge of the grid so that they serve the larger grid better so that they become sort of, they become grid infrastructure. And so, you know, a grid where everyone at the edge is smart and a generator and a, and a storage mechanism and load balancing and demand response and all these other things, um, 
is just radically, radically different <laughs> than the hub and spoke one way model. And we are just at the very front end of figuring out how that works. All our, not just our technology, but all our practices, all our regulations, all our sort of business models, everything, everything is set up around still the one-way models. To use the cliche, we're sort of frantically trying to rebuild the plane in flight. We're trying to keep the electricity grid going and reliable, even as we switch our focus to the sort of grid edge. And it's going to be a chaotic transition. And there's tons of ferment in there. There's tons of market opportunity. It just in terms of like figuring out the right models for this grid edge <clears throat> stuff. Like I just did a pod the other day on an, on an outfit that is making induction stoves. You know, you replace your gas stove with an electric yeah. induction stove, but with a battery in it, a relatively large battery in the stove, which, which does a couple of things. One is you can get surges of power beyond what you can get from any stove today, gas or, or electric. Yep. <clears throat> so for that's for cooking Two, you can cook when the power's out, right? Or you can yep. even plug your refrigerator into your stove and you could, this battery is big enough that you could run theoretically your whole home for a day or two on this battery. And plus, you know, plus eventually that battery is going to be in communication with the grid and the grid is going to be able to draw on that battery to store or release energy at times the grid needs. So if you can just imagine that, but every appliance, yeah. every car, every, every, every energy using or creating or storing device, all the billions of them out on the grid edge, all being very smart, all, communicating with each other, all trading power directly with each other without going through the central hub, that some version of that lies in our future. <laughs> Getting from yeah. here to there is going to be a mess. And there's going to be a lot of fortunes made and a lot of carcasses <laughs> all, along the road. But, but the infinitely, but, it's 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 so important because I think what maybe a lot of our, our listeners don't get credit to is like, how old our grid is, how I think let down by the lack of transmission infrastructure we are because of nimbyism and a whole host of other reasons why we don't actually have the power lines we need to, to get yep. the power to places where it needs to go. But even beyond that, we are bringing so many of these electrification options online, but they're all drawing power from this archaic grid. So it's, it's, it's not even just like a, well, this would be a nice to have for us to have some sort of bi-directional. It's like this whole future vision electrification of everything cannot survive if there is not some sort of bi-directional, you know, as you're describing it, decentralization of, <laughs> yeah. of energy. Yeah. I mean, uh, you can argue about what the sort of optimal grid architecture is and some sort of theoretical future, but in the real world... A lot of those decisions and a lot of the directions are going to be driven by just sort of semi-rational or irrational social forces or economic forces or just legacy systems or, or, or momentum of old dumb systems. Like you say, so a lot of, I think, you know, people will argue about, about how much we should rely on the sort of distributed energy at the grid edge versus centralized stuff. But I think we're going to be, as you say, driven in that direction just because the 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 central hub and spoke model is sort of breaking down it's very very old it's not getting repaired fast enough it's not getting replaced fast enough and if you can't get a transmission line to your area then you need to um maximize the work you get out of the energy that you can generate yeah. in situ right yeah. and and so there's just a lot of thinking going into how can we Generate, store, use, and share energy on the grid edge in the smartest possible way, minimizing the need for these big transmission lines. Well, and, and some of this, I think, is evolving in real time as we have the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. We've had, you know, billions of dollars for home electrification, EV tax credits, although the way they're being applied and, and all that stuff, we can have a, a much longer conversation on. Um, but, but, but even so, right, th there's stuff happening at the consumer level. And I think consumers are now waking up to 
uh, the incentives they have to electrify and, and, you know, better sort of prepare their homes to become these decentralized power cells. Um, but then also what's happening in terms of advanced manufacturing so that we can actually bring some of this production within the U.S. I mean, this to me, at least from my you know recollection or understanding, this is the largest um, electrification you know legislation that that has been passed anywhere uh, and, and across the <laughs> the globe. Uh, and and I could be wrong about that. Maybe they're doing things in in Sweden that we don't know about. But like what <laughs> what what leads to something? I think successfully being implemented because there's a lot of promises in this bill. And I know you've been you've been covering it for a while. I mean, what are what are the factors that are going to lead to this actually being a, a reality for the U.S.? Well, the whole story of the IRA is is fascinating. And I don't know that it's really well understood uh, in the general public because, you know, this kind of the focus has been on it as a climate bill, which it certainly is. It certainly is a climate and energy bill. But I would say if I only had one way to characterize it, one line I would characterize it primarily as a piece of industrial policy. In other words, it is it is overwhelmingly geared at creating and uh, um, sustaining and growing domestic industries. Moving, I mean, the 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 thing with the EV tax credits, however you think of how they're going about it, the goal is quite audacious. The goal is to stand up an entire. EV supply chain in the US from almost scratch, right? Like we're we're way, way, way behind in terms of yep. the minerals and the processing and manufacturing the batteries, et cetera, et cetera. Like we have some of the car factories, but but in terms of the the, the supply the chain components, we're, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to do that from almost nothing, you know, and, and it's the same in, in in several clean energy industries. So this is just an enormous, astonishing, eye-watering amount of money that is being dumped on domestic um, domestic industry, an attempt to sort of like bring manufacturing back to the U.S. as, as, as people have been talking about for, for years. And it's just a really audacious and large-scale effort to do that. Biggest, you know, the biggest legislation on those lines in my lifetime easily. Um, so the question is, you know, this this leads to a million questions. <laughs> a million <laughs> questions. One is, do we have in the U.S. the administrative capacity to do this well? Right. Hmm. Like it's one thing to come up with kajillions of dollars. It's another thing to spend it wisely and to know where it needs to be spent and right. to course correct as we go, you know, like in other countries like in Germany or something like that, they'll have a government agency whose sole purpose is sort of to be in touch with the private sector and to know <laughs> where things are moving and what their needs are. And they work very closely together on industrial policy in, in other countries. But in the U.S., we've had this sort of like neoliberal fever these last several decades where we've just sort of pretended we don't do that. We don't do industrial policy. We just let the market mm. do that, which was always BS. We always did it. We're just doing it behind our back without paying much attention to it. So, so we, so a lot of the sort of administrative capacity that you would need to know who needs money where and what's promising and what isn't is has has kind of um, <clears throat> decayed. So it'll be a fascinating experiment over the next five to ten years. Yeah, but even even if we're underestimating the cost of this the the sheer scale and the sheer volume of new investment new companies being formed um new supply chain you know opportunities uh, within that value chain for companies to be built i mean i think that's you know when when i when i talk to investors on the show uh and i, I think it might have been harsh patel from wireframe who said this is like this is going to be the greatest opportunity for wealth creation or value generation, however you want to say it, um, in in our lifetimes, uh, and, and perhaps the the, the generations prior to this, hundred percent. These investments are directly in are going are going to directly affect the quality of life of of Americans. Like Americans are going to see their houses get cleaner and more comfortable and less air pollution. I mean, if like you know, just think about electrifying postal vehicles just to take an example 
every community in the country has postal vehicles. Think about electrifying right. school buses. Every community in the country <clears throat> has school buses. And so every community in the country is going to see very tangibly the results of these investments and the improvement. Like, oh, my kids are not inhaling diesel fumes anymore. So that's yeah. going to be um, – that's an immense source of value and – so many things that we can't predict are going to come out of this. Like, you know, you can predict some of the basic building blocks of decarbonization, but just like once solar gets even super, super cheaper and then batteries get even super, super cheaper and smaller, like what can you do combining tiny, powerful solar with tiny, powerful batteries? Like you can put sensing and computing power and power generation anywhere anywhere yeah. on a power yeah. line in the middle of a field over your crops on your parking lot like like this stuff is going to be so miniaturized and so cheap it's going to become ubiquitous and then what happens if you have ubiquitous energy and information all around you all the time i don't know mm. <laughs> but some cool shit i mean you you come off to me as i think a pretty optimistic guy in this in this world of climate dread <laughs> And I know a lot of our listeners, even the ones that are working on really interesting technologies and climate solutions, it's hard to fight off that sense of climate anxiety. So maybe on like a personal level, like what, how, how does one stave that off? Because as much as <laughs> is happening, you know, you, you look out into the world and, and you don't see it happening fast enough. And we know the, the temperature thresholds and, you know, uh, uh, carbon capture targets we have to hit. And it doesn't seem like we're hitting them fast enough. So how do you stave off that that anxiety? I mean, th that's a, it's a complicated question. I mean, <laughs> people who know me would would laugh uproariously at the idea that I'm <laughs> I'm not optimist. <laughs> I mean, I spent many many years wallowing in this doom and preaching this doom and and banging on the table and trying to get people to take this coming doom more seriously. And you know, I spent my time. Plenty of time uh, wallowing that. And part of it is just if you're going to have a career, right, you can't you can't just be sort of melodramatically tearing your garments again and again, day after day after day after day after day. You just psychologically can't like you're going to burn yourself out. I've seen a, I've seen a lot of people yeah. come into this and then yeah. go back out just burned out because you just can't be sort of like you know, dramatically uh, hailing the end of the world day after day, you'll just, you'll wring yourself out. So you have to find some, some position of equilibrium. You have to find some way of just uh, 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 of taking it as it comes. But also, I mean, as bad as things look and we are not on track, it is also the case that a lot of the worst possibilities, a lot of the high end scenarios of truly like apocalyptic species ending kind of warming have kind of been shaved off in the models. Oh. Like we're, we're narrowing in on a bad, but not apocalyptic oh. <laughs> trajectory. And that's, and, and, and that is a relatively big change of, in trajectory in just the last, you know, 10 years, 10, 20 years. And like I say, momentum's just building and building and building. So I think speed is going to be, it's one of those things where, is it Bill Gates who has always said, like, we we overestimate change. That we can make in, in a I, year. Yeah, we make in a year. We underestimate what we do in 10 years. I forget the yeah. exact, I forget yeah. the exact. But that's very true here. I think when you look a year out, you're like, oh, we're not moving fast enough. But I think you look 10 years out and, and there's going to be so much momentum that the the rate of change, the rate of change is going to, pick up that's the hopeful that's the, that's the hopeful take and the other thing i just say is you know i get asked about this a lot this sort of climate dread thing i just i just say like um you know say you did conclude that we're screwed and and, and climate change is going to be horrible you still it, it could still be better or worse, right? It could still be a little better or a little bit worse. Like, mm. what are you going to do? Are you going to are you going to just go to bed and, and and give up? No, you're gonna you're gonna get up and fight regardless. 
no matter whatever our degree of doomedness, it doesn't change what you need to do, which is just yeah. get up and do the fucking work, you know? So, yeah. uh, uh, you know, it, a lot of it's, a lot of this discussion just sort of devolves into kind of the aesthetic, I think, you, you know, just like, what's my identity? <laughs> what, how do I want to come off online? What degree of doomer am I, you know, what team am I on? And I just, I, eh, all that stuff is whatever, just do the work. You know, everybody's yeah. got this, the, the beauty of this fight now, and this is, you know, what I was trying to convey earlier is <clears throat> it's opened up in a way that there are so many entree points to it now. Like you can get involved in this fight from any angle, mm -hmm. finance, technology, entrepreneurship, public administration, like you name it. There's a way into this fight. So everybody's got their hands on some levers. Everybody can pull the levers that they have <laughs> within reach and that's what you need to do, whether you're nine out of 10, you know, <laughs> dreadful or, or six out of 10 dreadful, whatever, you know. Wherever you are is, on that scale, there's work to be done. Wherever you are on that scale, just get up and do the work. Nothing's going to cheer you up like doing the work and interacting with other people who are doing the work. Yeah. Well, that is, David, a fantastic place, I think, to leave our conversation. Where can people find more of your uh cautioned optimism uh if, if they if they want to find it uh on on the work that you're doing it's a uh, volts.wtf perfect hey i love that that is that is a, <laughs> a, a a url ending i have not come across but i that's that's fantastic uh, that that's where you found yourself yes exactly well look uh david this was a fantastic conversation i i could talk to you for hours and i hope that we'll have you back on the show maybe yeah. As we see some of these tax credits Anytime, actually yeah. develop out past the next uh, next tax season, I think my two biggest takeaways from the conversation today, um, one is just that the second order effects of the eye-watering amount of money, as you called it, that we're spending on you know bringing supply chain costs down by bringing them to the U.S., by bringing production and manufacturing costs down, is going to create so many more opportunities for investment and entrepreneurship. And I know that's what our, our listeners primarily, you know, think about and, and care about. Mm -hmm. But then but then secondly, it's that this work needs to get done, you know, whether or not we are trying to hit some sort of mythical reduction target, right? And and you doing Fast the work is, possible, is still gonna right? This is yes. what I always say about <laughs> targets. Target this, target that, this degree, that degree, this PPM, that PM, fast as possible. There's no yeah. there is zero percent chance that we're going to go too fast. So just mm. go as fast as you can, right? I like that. I like that. Well, thank you so much, David. We're um, so grateful to have you on and we hope to have you back on soon. Thanks, guys. Well, that's all for this week's episode of Climb by VSC. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Special thanks to Credo for their help in producing and promoting this episode. To visit any part of today's conversation again, you can find the full transcript on vscventures.com. Our thanks to Josue Ramiro for posting these every week. Lastly, if you've listened this far, please leave us a rating on Spotify or review on iTunes. It only takes a few seconds, really helps us out, and as far as I know, it's still carbon neutral. Well, that's all for now. We'll see you all next week on Climb by VSC.